This morning we have two great speakers. Uh, one of them is Gary Brad, uh, Bernard. He's the president of C and CEO of Extraordinary Innovation Space Partnership. Uh, Gary Bernard is the owner and president of Bernard Associates, LLC, a system engineering consulting firm and an internet service provider. Uh, based in Maryland, he is a robotic system sy uh, space system engineer whose professional work includes a wide range of robotic space and computer system engineering projects. Uh, over the last 34 years, he's been extensively involved in the space advocacy community um, as a co-founder and executive director of Maryland Alliance for Space Colonization, uh, one of the most successful chapter affiliates of the L5 Society as founder and executive director of the Space Development Foundation, as a public speaker on space advocacy issues, and as an organizer of space-related education programs and conferences, and much more. Our second speaker, Jeff Fridge, uh, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Orbital Outfitters. Jeff Fridge is, a, is currently the CEO of Orbital Outfitters a company which was founded to provide safe, affordable, and stylish space pressure suits for the first wave of normal people intent upon entering space. He has served in the role for the past six years and has worked to move the company from its first suit concepts to actual flight units. Uh, prior to his work with Orbital Outfitters, Jeff worked as a strategy and policy consultant at Polish Space. Before joining Polish Space, Jeff was the assistant to the executive director of Aerospace State Associates an organization representing the U.S. states on matters relating to aerospace policy. In the past, he's managed both the Return to the Moon Conference and Newspaper Conference for Space Front, uh, Frontier Foundations. Uh, he holds a BS from Dextral University in Philadelphia and is a valid scuba diver, sailor, and private pilot. So uh, please uh, help me welcome uh, our guest speakers tonight. All right. Thank you all for coming. I real we realize that it's a bit early, but um, you know the uh, you know oftentimes uh, you know when uh, you know if you're you're interested in making a business you have to get up early uh, and you know, stay up a bit on the late side. Um, this um, uh, discussion was cast as you know well, uh, an exploration of the space business case. Uh, you know what. Uh, you know, Jeff and I are going to try and offer you uh, is both a uh, you know the uh, connection to the broader notion of our understanding of uh, you know both uh, what it takes to um, you know make a space business and you know a little bit of our uh, you know personal experience in terms of what it takes to make it real. Uh, for me, I'm a bit of a youngster to the business. I. Uh, you know, I got involved in earnest uh, in 1976, and if uh, you know, continued you know, thereafter. You know, I started you know uh, off in a situation where I basically became aware, watching the Gemini launches come up, and I was going to be an astronaut. There was no issue or argument there. Yeah, I had this interesting problem, despite the fact that I uh, memorized the eye chart. They eventually figured out that. Yeah, I was just about blind. <laughs> yeah, so much for you know losing your career when you're in fourth grade. Um, but uh, you know, as it ended up evolving, I found myself in the you know peculiar position of being uh, 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 you know in high school and real you know when I was 16 years old that you know if I worked very very hard for the next 40 years. I could end up where I was at 16, which this particular case was hanging out in a uh, Watergate penthouse in Washington, D.C. that some crazy bachelor had had and enjoying the, route, the view of the Potomac River. And it occurred to me that, you know, there had to be some other angles on this. And, you know, I had discovered this character, uh, you know, Gerard K. O'Neill, uh, you know, a good physicist that had gone rogue and started talking to the general public about, you know, what's the, um, what's the future that they'd like to see come to pass uh, and be a part of. And, you know, that seemed to, you know, it was an, all, an opportunity, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, help provide for, you know, uh, you know, opening the frontier of space in earnest. And, 
you know, the deal was, of course, in order for me to fly, virtually anybody that wanted to needed to be able to, and I thought that was cool. So I set about on the, uh, the, the quest to, uh, you know, try and find a way to, um, to make things real in those regards. I had I encountered a few roadblocks my first semester, first day, actually, of college at the University of Maryland College Park. I went to see the esteemed chairman of the Aerospace Engineering Department, a one Dr. John Anderson, who, if you've ever crossed paths with an aerodynamics textbook, chances are he wrote it. Um, and you know, he asked me what it was that I wanted to do. And I said, well, I want to help build large space structures, space stations, help provide for space development in earnest. He looked at me and said, you know, I really appreciate your enthusiasm, Gary. You'll just never get a paying job in the space business. Yeah, that struck me as a bit, uh, a bit harsh, but uh, yeah, I said, you know, I, have, I uh, have to acknowledge your position, but I don't have to agree. And I left his office and enrolled in uh, you know, graduate school. I, uh, you know, my undergraduate career basically lasting a day of sorts. <laughs> um, and it, it led me to an interesting path, which is uh, this peculiar notion of serial entrepreneurship. The, um, one of the, you know, the, where this uh, leads into, though, is this notion of, you know, really, what is a business case? Uh, in traditional terms, uh, it's, you know, uh, comparatively straightforward. It's this, you know, uh, the, the monetary return on investment over a reasonable period of time. Uh, the shorter, the better, usually. Um, however, with respect to space and a number of other great enterprises, uh, there's a bit more refinement to the equation. I argue that it's really a question of the value proposition, and what you're looking at is the uh, summation of the benefits minus the summation of the risks. Uh, you know, a lot of the return is not just uh, you know, in a, uh, you know, a uh, direct monetary deal, in, at least in terms of uh, normal investment criteria. That's not to say that you don't uh, you know, well, what, what your business to make money, but usually there's some other piece of the puzzle there. You've heard, uh, heard this from a number of other speakers, that it isn't just about the what and the how, but it's the fundamental issue of what's the why. Because it's that why that's going to get you up in, in the morning. It's going to you know, be, be with you, keeping you uh, there, uh, you know, working through all hours of the night. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, the way that it ends up, uh, you know, making a, a business work, and in, in my case, I've, uh, you know, been involved with startup businesses, small businesses, you know, 8A, uh, you know, firms that were trying to grow into, uh, uh, you know, engineering services. I worked for, um, you know, Grumman on the space station. Uh, systems engineering and integration contract is a large business. I've been on the uh, the gov you know the, the government side, uh, you know the contractor side, and each of them, each of those vantage points offers you, you know some per some perspective on it. But you're you're looking for a, a successful business enterprise. One, you need to know why you're there, but there's also uh, you know the uh, what amounts to being there's this notion of a value proposition. When you're in a business where you uh, you bring forward your product to a you know a potential well, you know, audience that might like to purchase it, and you explain what it is, and their first reaction is to pull out their checkbooks. You know you're on to something. Uh, okay. Uh, I've had. Um, you know, the, the privilege of having that happen a number of times. And when I've gone back and, and looked at it, you know, it was, an, a, in a sense, an, a, an exquisite balancing of the benefits and the risk. Um, and usually what I've thrown into the lurch was, um, you know, my efforts and, you know, the, 
efforts of folks, my associates, who, uh, you know, the, the terms that I've offered was, listen, I'll find a way to pay you to do what you want to do. And, you know, we'll, you know, and I'll work the impedance mismatch between that and what the clients are willing to pay for. Uh, that's, uh, that's a, you know, uh, an example. In a, in a sense, an example of a, an adaptive model that can, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, buffer the what is oftentimes, you know, uh, you know, a mismatch between, you know, what some, you know, uh, somebody perceives they're willing to pay for, versus, um, you know, what, uh, what, what is what you're necessarily able to deliver. Um, a, an interesting thing. Uh, you know that uh, you know sort of underlies this is uh, there are in the world of engineering there are what amounts to being point design problems where you know in, in many cases uh, you know, the term used to be you know a, a board engineering problem you know it's a defined problem where uh, what you go off and do is you find you, know, you uh, get some engineers together that know uh, know, know how to turn the crank you feed them. Uh, feed them the input, pay them to turn the crank, and out comes a known product. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, yeah, there's some good work there, but uh, there's a, a not, there's a piece of the puzzle beyond that, which is the idea of working effectively the general problems in a uh, in a particular domain or discipline. If you can find some way to have some insight uh, in those regards, what you discover is is that your work is applicable across multiple uh, skill, uh, you know, problems in that space. And for uh, you know, any, any business endeavor that you want to uh, go forward to, to the extent that you can have the, the flexibility of being able to uh, you know, have, the, have the resources to work some aspect of the general problem in the domain, you still have to you know, it still has to, uh, you know, come down to something that someone's going to be willing to pay for. But it affords you a greater flexibility to adapt uh, to the market in those regards. Also, you have no idea what is ultimately going to be the way your potential clients actually understand what it is that you're going to, that, that you're, uh, you're trying to do. Uh, we've ended up in a situation um, you know, the uh, a lot what I did is I spent most of my professional career as a robotic space systems engineer you know the uh, uh, you know, for, for, for a time I knew everybody on the planet that had any you know uh, thing close to uh, an intersection with uh, my job description you know, and you know as a uh, you know as a consequence that you know afforded me a certain degree of um, you know, uh, you know, insight into um, the uh, the work in uh, uh, you know the, the general problems and my my domains of interest. And I ended up when uh, the uh, political winds changed with respect to the space station program. And uh, you know, I was told that I had an opportunity to either live in a hotel room in Clear Lake, Texas, or live in a hotel room in Clear Lake, Texas. Uh, I ended up inverting my uh, vocations and avocations. If you know, I had set myself through engineering school, uh, you know, doing computer consulting. It was a little bit weird for the university to be paying a freshman uh, student consulting rates. But, you know, hey, you know, I, uh, I figured out something the university needed. You know, once upon a time, you know, you know, word processors really didn't exist. I went and took one that some crazy graduate student had programmed on a mainframe computer and figured out how the uh, different departments could use that to uh, do their grant proposals. So I would go through and um, you know teach their staff, you know how to uh, make things work. And strangely enough, you know they uh, swallowed your pride and wrote the checks. Uh, okay. Um, but where this you know uh, ended up evolving is is that you know I took and. Um, took the, the skills that I had, uh, in a sense, you know, what you could think of as some stranded intellectual property, uh, you know, that I had developed as a NASA grantee, uh, graduate student researcher, 
and my work in space station land and turn that into uh, a viable set of uh, you know both um, hardware, software, and services uh, that you know could be sold uh, on a commercial basis. Basically, I brought um, you know high availability, um, you know high performance uh, computing to a small business environment. I you know was started you know designing and uh, you know fielding. Uh, what amounts to being remotely managed point of presence systems, essentially internet service providers in a box, selling them to law firms and accounting firms who love the idea that they had a freaking rocking scientist worried about you know, their information technology requirements and brought in uh, a set of uh, you know, associates that helped me, helped me do this. And you know, one of the, the interesting things about it was is that that business you know, they're, you know, sure we sold, you know, um, you know, uh, what it turns out to be, you know, uh, you know, anything under the sun in terms of information technology equipment. And hell, if you wanted suns, we could sell you those too. But we, we took, uh, you know, this uh, aggregate, uh, if you will, and, you know, demonstrated that, you know, we could actually understand what mattered to the clients. In the world of information technology, there's really three things you can buy. You can buy performance, you can buy availability, and you can buy security. You've you built if you field systems that don't address all three of those vectors, they fail. It's just a matter of time. If you go through and you know orchestrate things appropriately, you can you know give uh, clients an option to buy what they need. That's an example of, in, in a sense, the insight into the general problem, which we were able to go uh, in market. I took, you know, you know, this, you know, this, the research of what I was doing in the world of robotic space systems engineering, and translated it into a level that uh, a bunch of lawyers and accountants, you know, could understand. Uh, when you're, if you want to make a business work, if you will, uh, you know, particularly a startup, but it's the same, in a sense, it's the same equation, if you will, uh, so that, you, that you've got to work uh, in any scale of your organization. I coped with it um, when I went to work for a 8A uh, firm called Engineering and Economics Research, which was a, um, over, had an over-glorified documentation contract at the Goddard Space Flight Center, but they wanted to go into engineering, cert, develop a practice in engineering services. I went and figured out how to sell the, uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center on the idea that we could provide critical engineering services to help breathe life into the space station program. Um, and you know, as a as a consequence, as a consequence. Uh, you know, by going through and delivering product, which they, uh, which ex you know, it not just met their expectations but exceeded it. It developed a uh, helped develop a new practice for what became EER Systems, and so uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, was part of the uh, introductory uh, world of um, you know commercial space. But uh, a good example there was. I was in a in a meeting where we had been working on the uh, developing a space station information systems uh, requirements document, and the uh, you know the, the NASA our NASA counterpart said, but what we really need to make this accessible is an index, and the uh, you know the traditional firms that uh, you know folks that work these things in my firm you know went off and explained that well it takes over six weeks to do that, and the you know, the, my NASA counterpart looked at him and said, I'm sorry, but you know, we don't have that. And I said, well, tell you what, you know, let me go back to the office yeah, tonight and I'll think about it. And we'll meet tomorrow. I took, uh, you know, that, that document back to the office. We had, you know, a uh, mini computer system called a VAX there. I wrote a program that uh, reversed out a keyword out of context index. Uh, you know, for um, you know, for the document, both keyword and key phrase, 
brought it back the next day, done. Okay, and you know, at, at that point, our uh, NASA counterpart realized there was something different about our company. Okay, it's the, you know, it's the, and that, that goes back to this question of understanding the why. Okay, if you know what matters in the business that you're trying to create, okay, it is that insight that lets you not only work the uh, you know, strategic issues, but the on the on the tactical issues on a day-to-day -day basis that lets you, um, you know, be able to anticipate and meet what amounts to be the real requirements uh, of your. Um, you know, customers in those regards. Um, the um, uh, you know one of the, one of the things that you know I, I also think is you know wonderful. You know I had had effectively the honor and privilege of being paid to do what I want to do for my entire professional career. Okay, not because somebody handed me on the handed it to me on the plate. In part because I was you know uh, you know. Uh, you know, it's this peculiar situation where, um, you know, uh, you know, I was crazy enough to, uh, you know, uh, do real work in this business for free before anyone, uh, you know, ever decided to pay me to do it. Uh, you know, I knew why I was there, and you know, was willing to go to um, uh, inordinate uh, lengths in those regards. Um, you now, that's how I ended up uh, in a larger company, uh, Roman. Um, I ended up as the effectively owning the system level requirements for advanced automation and robotics for the space station program. My team got to write the robotic systems integration standards from scratch. They didn't exist. We had to reverse engineer the robotic systems necessary to assemble and maintain uh, you know, a, a space station when you know, we, you know, the yeah, you know, we were reverse engineering systems that didn't exist. Okay, and you know we found a way to make it real. And again, that was because the combination of associates that we had, that I had there, at Grumman, all knew why they were there. Um, one of my mentors, uh, uh, you know, at uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center in the Advanced Missions Analysis Office, explained it to me in no uncertain terms. Gary, when you're doing it right, even the folks that are pulling the trash know why they're there. Okay, and this is something that you not only have to internalize within yourself, but uh, be able to, uh, you know, inculcate the folks that are going to be working with you. Uh, and uh, there's actually another very important rule with respect to, I would argue, success in these regards. We all have to get over ourselves. None of us can make any uh, claim to immaculate perception, okay? You're not going to, in very, very rare instances, do you ever succeed just on your own. It's your ability to figure out how to uh, work with people, how to, you know, learning how to make things happen that is fundamentally going to make a difference in, in the enterprises that you find yourself engaged in. Now, uh, you know, hopefully I'm not, you know, uh, haven't, uh, you know, um, you know, managed to put anybody to sleep there. But, you know, this is, this is a twist that we have to find <laughs> some angle on. Uh, we'll get, uh, you know, Jeff to uh, chime in here on his thoughts on the matter. Okay. Um, my thought is I'll talk to you for about 10, 15 minutes and then let's just kind of leave it open and the extent we want to discuss space business on that. So I'm just gonna to cut to the chase quickly. Most of what I'm gonna discuss is my time at Orbital Outfitters and various questions that have come up about the whole issue. Um, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on my back history, but I will say that I heard that there was a 1976. And uh, good on you for that. Um, I wanna give half a second for why I ended up in this industry. Because I never found out about SEDS until two years after I got out of college. So I didn't have the privilege you guys are having, but when I was growing up, again, I'm as bad as Gary, all I ever wanted to do was be an astronaut. 
And it was pretty clear to me by about my junior and senior year of high school that I was not smart enough to be an astronaut. And the difference between, for me, even today, years later, the difference between new space and old space is that whereas old space flies a few people who they call astronauts who, from my perspective, are a whole lot smarter than me, new space is an industry working towards flying all of us. And for me, that's, that's my why. So when someone says, why do you do this? It's because we're moving towards that kind of a future. Now, where does that leave us? Orbital Outfitters has been in business for the last seven years. Business being a relative term for at least two of those years in the middle there. Now, what's interesting about our business is that it is what I would call a second tier type company. And what I mean by that is you've got all the, the names of companies that everybody knows really well, like on the you know orbital side right now in, in commercial crew, we're looking at you know um, SpaceX and Boeing and Sierra Nevada on the one hand, and then in the suborbital side we're looking at x -Core and Virgin and Blue Origin and Armadillo and some others. And all of those companies, they're building things that fly and then they're going to sell those services to someone else. They're going to sell them to NASA or they're going to sell them to uh, commercial customers or they're going to sell them to people with money who want to go take rides. Good on them, good business plan. Me sitting here with Orbital Outfitters, we are a secondary provider, so we sell space and pressure suits to those companies. So our success or failure is predicated upon the success or failure of those launch companies. And therein lies the problem, because all of those companies are moving towards an exciting goal, and they're making progress. But their progress, as I'm sure all of you have noted over the last few years, has been less expeditious than they all hoped it would be. And what that means is that as a second tier company, you're left kind of scratching your head and saying, how do I keep myself afloat and alive in the meantime? And I can talk about some of the specifics on that, and I may tell you a story here in a moment. But I think that's a good analogy for the entire business that we're in. That is, in a normal business, and um, much like Gary, I have, I've been involved in multiple companies, I've got multiple, even today I have multiple businesses that I'm doing. And when you're in the traditional business world, it's very easy to draw out the equation of what are you doing and why are you doing it. We're delivering XYZ product or service because when we do it, somebody wants it for some reason. We do it a little better than somebody else. Ergo, we get paid. The reason I get up in the morning is because I'm getting paid to make a product or a service that's a little better than somebody else. Cut and dry, it's really simple. And yet, over on the space side, I would assert, as a slightly in contrast to you, that that is exactly where we're headed in the space side. The catch is, that's not where we are today. And if that's where you want to go, and if that's where you want to be, and if that's what you're expecting, for the next decade or two, this is probably the wrong industry. And I, re I realize I may be wandering a, a little bit out on a limb with that statement, but let me try to draw it out a little and show what I mean. When I sit down and go to dinner with someone who is thinking about investing in orbital outfitters, the conversation usually goes something like this. I show them how much money we've made over the last few years, I show our projections and say, well, this is how much money we're hoping to make, and with you know, with you putting your money in, this is what we're hoping for it to be. And if and when they ask a question 
that is something like, well, this all looks pretty good, but I'm trying to decide whether I should invest my money in a space business or if I should invest my money in a more traditional business. And you know, can you can you discuss the risks of your business versus a more traditional business? If the conversation comes to that point, that's usually the point where I, in my own head, regardless of what I say to them, I've already made the decision that I'm not willing to take that money. That, that decision gets made at that moment. And the reason is because if your primary driver for investing your money in this business is, will it make more money than some more traditional business? Or am I likely to see the same kind of return that I will in some traditional business? And your primary driver is money? That's not someone who's going to fit in well into this world because while I think that's exactly where the business ends, where within 10, 20 years, that's exactly where we're all going to be, there are so many question marks, so many unproven things, so many difficult questions to answer, so much risk, that if people aren't walking into this with open eyes and a lot of passion, then they're probably in the wrong place. And honestly, for those of us who are seeking careers in the industry, I think that we have to keep that in mind too. That if the thing that gets you up in the morning is your paycheck, there are easier jobs than this, <laughs> right? There are other places you can go. You need to think about space as, it, it, I, let me let me try to let me try to back up and, and summarize and then then let's leave it a little bit more open for a discussion. <coughs> when where I started this conversation when I was talking about Orbital Outfitters being a second tier company, let let me walk you through our core business case. We have secondary lines of business. We do other things. The the latest one is that we've been doing complete vehicle mock-ups in addition to space and pressure suits. But let's play a little bit of a business game with you guys as an audience here. We sell spacesuits. So we sell them to the companies that fly the vehicles, and they buy them from us. And so it's a business to business transaction, which means we only have to negotiate with two or three customers, which is really convenient. And our success is going to be based on how many they buy and when they buy it. So Let's pretend for a moment that you guys are thinking of putting some money into our business. Now, the question that you're going to ask me is, how many suits is, uh, oh, let's, let's pick an easy one. Let, how many suits is X-Core going to buy from Orbital Outfitters? And what year are they going to buy them? And how many flights are they going to have each progressive year for the next five years? And if you can just answer me that question and right within 70-80%, we're going to do a great job again. So think about that problem for a little bit. How many years is it going to be before they're ready to fly? It might be a year, it might be two years, it's been two years for the last seven years. Uh, and that's not, that's not a dig. And that's not a dig at anyone. I mean, the, you've got Virgin Galactic across the street that spent a quarter billion dollars on the same problem. And they're not quite ready yet either. And they've been two years away for the last five years. Heck, Richard Branson got on TV to say that they were two years away for the last five years. So, from my position, sitting there saying, what's the business case for space? The business case for space is there. If it wasn't there, we should have wrapped this thing up and gone home already. But how big is it? When is it? How is it going to play out? And when do I finally get to... You know, see the kind of see some real, real money in this business. Well, that's a darn hard question, and that comes back to the original topic where we were starting. What's the why? Why are you here? And for at least the next few years, the why has to be something more than I'm looking to make a living. The why has to be because I'm changing things, because I'm doing things. And I would rather than try to answer that specifically. I would point to some of the speeches that you've seen at this conference. I'd point to Rick Tumlinson's speech the first day. I'd point to Jim Muncy's speech yesterday. These guys are hitting at a why that gets them up in the morning. It's very similar to the why that gets me up in the morning. And if you
you want to jump in to this industry, you are at least the new space side of it. The traditional space side of it, yeah, you know, you, you probably can actually make it just being an engineer and, you know, you get fed under the door, you do what you're told, and that's a job. But if you're looking to do something really different, and if you're looking to the excitement of the new space side, you're going to have to bring your own why to it. Otherwise, there are better ways to spend your time. There's an interesting uh, thing related to that. You know, um, when I went to work for Grumman, it was a real uh, eye-opener to them to discover that the reason why I was there wasn't the money. Okay, uh, this what uh, this actually uh, you know uh, you know struck terror in the heart of uh, you know uh, middle management, <laughs> and that you know. Uh, there, there's something going on there, and of course, you know, you drew an organizational chart, and I was, you know, seventh tier on that organizational chart, but there was a defined line item in the space station budget that uh, I ended up, you know, having you know, responsibility for. Uh, you, know, they, you know, so there's this puzzle, you know, in any venue that you're going to, that you choose to engage in. If you understand the why of why you're there, you can transform, in many cases, what it is that you're, you're working on uh, in, in directions that, you know, well, one can you know, suit your interest in, in your broader goals. But it's not, you know, well, uh, you know, uh, it isn't the mushroom style of management with respect to engineers where you, uh, you know, you know, throw them in the dark, give them, uh, give them excrement, and uh, watch them grow. Okay, uh, you've got uh, you. You have to, uh, you know, fi figure out that there's there's something about what you are doing that you know relates to a um, uh, a broader picture, if you will. Um, now the uh, which brings us back to uh, in terms of you folks. Why do you think you're here? Any volunteers to uh, fess up? I don't necessarily need anyone to, <laughs> to, to apologize for their presence, but, but, the, but the thing that I, I guess I would say is we've got oh, probably 10, 15 minutes left up, left up here. You've got two of us who have been trying to make a business in an area where there's not a strong defined history of making new businesses in the sense of commercial businesses at least. And I guess what I would throw out is that beyond, beyond fessing up to why you're here, although you're welcome to do that, I, I, I think, I, honestly, I think I've heard a lot of that since I've been here. One of my, my, my question that I would put out to you, and if, if anyone wants to jump in, is what advice can people who've actually survived doing this as a career offer you? And feel free to also approach us privately. I mean, we're, we're pretty easy folks to talk to. But does anyone want to jump out? I realize it's a Sunday morning, and I, I re realize what that last night was for all of us. So. <laughs> anyone want to throw anything out on that? job in the space business and you've got a, a technical bent, find some way to touch real hardware, real software, find some way to be a part of actually building something. Okay? That is sort of, you know, ground, ground zero on this because they, you know, it's been argued that that's sort of the holy grail of the space business. Okay? You know, hardware experience. Being able to find a way to, to do that, one, one way or another, is going to make a difference. Going through, finding some way that you can, you know, as you, as you get out of school, finding some way that you can, you know, fund your operation, uh, you know, that, you know, gives you enough time to be able to think and develop the, the why, if you will, and figure out what the opportunity engagement art. I had to, you know, um, when I uh, struck out on, on my own, I bet the farm that 
you know, because you know, I was told you know, in certain terms that it made no sense whatsoever uh, that I wasn't going to be a part of the space station program. Uh, so, you know, they, with the money that had been invested in me, it made no sense. But it turned out, of course, that the transition to uh, you know, bring the Russians in required delaying the program for a couple of years. And um, the, uh, my, uh, uh, you know, my little, uh, the, the contract to secure my services was small, you know, uh, you know was, uh, you know, uh, you know far, far, far modest in comparison to the lawsuits between all the different, uh, you know, contractors uh, that were going on. And Grumman flat out told me that, you know, uh, you know, if I, uh, you know, had any contact with uh, anyone besides the uh, contract termination officer with NASA until the lawsuits were settled, I'd be on the wrong side of the table. I think Grumman had more lawyers than I ever would. Uh, you know, so there's, there's some, you know, you're, you've got to have some way uh, that lets you, you know, um, you know, live some semblance of a normal life and, that, and be able to engage in your interests. I went and made a commercial uh, company work in the IT business uh, to the point where I could fund my own research projects. And there's something exquisite about being able to respond to a research proposal with what you think really matters, independent of whether or not it's funded or not. Okay? You, you get to articulate what it is that you know and what your path is for. And you may not, it may not work for that particular solicitation but it's part of a broader fund of resources that you can draw on going forward to provide for your engagement. So it's these pieces of the puzzle that you know, uh, make, it, uh, you know, make, it, make it possible, because you're not, you can't bet on the fact that you know, um, you know, the, uh, the space business is going to give you a regular check you know, uh, you know, as, a, as a startup, but you can do something that's real. Yeah. I'll try to, you, you ask a very hard question, and if it's not clear from our two comments, it's a question that we've both struggled with a lot over the years, but I'll, I'll try to lay out the various, how about this, I'll try to cover the waterfront of the different types of paths that are out there, rather than say, do this one or do that one. There is a fairly traditional route, mostly through engineering and a technical approach, where you can go and work at a number of large government contractors. There are a bunch out there. Sometimes they're hiring, sometimes they're firing. It's luck of the draw and luck of a whole lot of other things, whether the moment when you graduate from school happens to be a moment when they're in an upswing or a downswing. Um, to tell a fun aside, it's not really fun, but to tell an aside, I was offered a management position at one of the larger contractors about two years ago. And the woman who was going to hire me took me to dinner and she, she said, let me tell you a little bit about how our business works. And she proceeded to explain that there are about 300 people who work for the company. They had about 20 of those people who they considered important. And those 20 were the people who would write the proposals each time they chased new government money. And then, as she explained, was depending on whether we win or lose those proposals, we just hire or fire our 300 people up or down to meet that proposal. So if, if uh, things don't really work out, we go south, we'll just let 100 of them go. And uh, that's kind of the, your job description. You'll be chasing work and firing people when it doesn't work out. So there is one path there. It's fairly traditional. It's fairly understood. You can go that route. It's not new space, but that's sort of the, that's, that's what the space business in large part always was. That's one route. Route number two is you have the emergence of various new space companies, both some very small in the, like mine in the single digits of people, or some that are quite large like SpaceX, which, you know, they, they have a lot of turnover over there, so they're hiring right and left, so it's always worth, everyone in the room, it's always worth throwing a resume out there. And to Gary's initial point, the nice thing about just about all of the new space companies, from SpaceX all the way down to the little ones, you will touch design and do real work with real hardware in just about every one of them. And 
even if you decide that this whole new space thing isn't for you in the long term, that opportunity is enormous because having actually either designed or worked on something that's flown or had got your hands really dirty building something, that's a skill set that in the traditional contracting world that I described a moment ago, that is very hard to find. That's path number two. Path number three, which you also called out in your question, is going and trying to do some flavor of it yourself. And whether that means ganging together a bunch of people and trying to start your own organization, and speak to jumping off that cliff, or whether that means you believe that you have a specific skill set and trying to translate that skill set into sort of uh, a one or two person contracting business, basically running around as a consultant of some kind, that would seem to be a third path. I will say that the path number three is especially difficult if you haven't followed path number one or two for a few years first. Because the organizations that we're looking at or the kinds of services that folks in the new space industry are, are going to need demands a certain amount of experience first. For the most part, I mean, there are a few things. That, there are a few jobs that are not getting done, and maybe if maybe if you're in the right place at the right time, right when people have funding, there's an opportunity there. But in large part, I would say that the the, the overall path is you've got some some ventures that are out there doing really innovative things. Try to find ways to get associated with them, even if those are unpaid ways to get associated with them and then see how the path begins to develop. And these organizations are growing. There's more money than there was before. Things are slowly moving along. But that, that's kind of the entire waterfront of what you can do. And it's not, I don't mean to be, and I know all of us at this conference are guilty of this, I don't mean to be over, overly engineering specific. Because to be perfectly frank, there's no shortage of engineers. I mean, there's a shortage of engineers in the country, but in the aerospace business, it's mostly engineers. There's actually a significant need for folks who are looking at other parts of the problem, be those safety or regulatory or business, uh, especially business development. Now, the real shame of it is, while there's a huge need for all those kind of functions, there's also not a whole lot of money for those kind of functions. In companies that are focused on building something, you often have a conversation that goes something like, We've got about 20 unfilled positions that don't involve building something, but we've only got just enough money to finish building the darn thing. So, you know, if you could work for free, that would be awesome. <laughs> but, but that's usually how that goes. So the, I, I think that's kind of a crack of your question. Do you want to grab yeah. one the, the, the other, yeah, the, uh, just uh, quickly related to that is, is there is a piece of the puzzle that, you know, goes beyond the engineering. What it takes to actually make a uh, a business succeed, uh, you know, on a uh, on an ongoing basis is particularly when you're with, when you're dealing with a bunch of uh, you know uh, uh, engineers is you need some folks that can translate. Yeah. Uh, okay. You, you know the um, uh, folks that understand the importance of deadlines. Uh, okay. Actually dealing with uh, you know bureaucracies. Okay, uh, yeah. it, it may seem utterly freaking mundane to you folks, but the idea of getting people to actually turn their time in, for God's sakes, you know, so that you can bill for it, uh, you know, it's, you know it, it ends up being an extraction process. So there, you know, uh, you know, recognize there's a whole, a whole bunch of pieces, you know, besides just the, uh, you know, the raw engineering piece of things. But, you know, how is it? Thinking you know, is uh, an, an engineer. Uh, you know, the, uh, you, that's the sort of answer that that you get from me. First is the engineering, and you know, I I learned the need for the rest of it. You know, in certain terms. Some other questions that we can take on? Around the rest of the day, we're approachable guys. There's not, I mean, this is not a huge crowd. 
grab us in the hallway, grab us in the lobby. I'm, I'm around the balance of the day. Indeed. Same, same here, and also uh, extraordinary innovative space partnerships is hiring. Okay, both uh, you know uh, now for um, uh, you know 1099 contract positions, but folks that are interested in working on technology development missions, uh, you know both on a graduate and undergraduate level, as well as uh, you know folks that would be interested in working towards uh, you know part-time and full-time positions and such things. So, please talk to us.